All right. Active here. One second, bear with me. All right. Um, okay. So, um, good morning, colleagues. Greetings, all. Welcome to this PANCAP webinar, webinar in collaboration with the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, to provide you with an update on MPOX. I am Dr. Shanti St. Anthony the Knowledge Management Coordinator at the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV and AIDS, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. As you would know, on August 14, 2024, WHO declared MPOX a public health emergency of international concern, following the deliberations and advice of the International Health Regulation Emergency Committee. Building on the lessons of COVID-19, and the global MPOX outbreak in 2022, our Caribbean countries have heightened their surveillance efforts to ensure early detection and control. To tell us more, we have five experts who will present on various aspects of MPOX. But before I introduce our presenters, let me share with you, as usual, a few housekeeping notes. Um, first, your mics are muted, so if you have any questions, Please type and submit these using the chat feature on your webinar panel. You can leave questions as the presentations are happening. Um, we will take all of the questions during the Q&A segment at the end of the presentation. Uh, second, we are recording the webinar. The recording will be shared on PANCAP's social media platforms and on PANCAP's website to the benefit of those persons who could not have attended this live session now. Um, but importantly, in terms of the recording, by continuing to be at this webinar, you're consenting to being recorded. Third, at the end of the session, you will receive a certificate of participation, but you will also receive a post receive a post webinar survey. And I ask that you kindly give us your feedback. Take the survey and give us your feedback. At the end of the webinar, you will also we will email the presentation to everyone. Um, like I said, we have five presenters for today's session, and I will introduce each presenter aligned to the order in which they will present, and I will hand you over to our first presenter, Dr. Monica Alonso, who will take it from there, but allow me to introduce our presenters. So our first presenter is Dr. Monica Alonso. She obtained her medical degree at the Complutense University of Madrid and her PhD in epidemiology from the University Autonoma of Madrid. She holds a master in public health from the Institute of Health Carlos III of Madrid and a master's in management of health services from the Pompey Fabra University of Barcelona. Dr. Alonso joined CAHO WHO in 2005 as, a strategic, as the advisor to strategic information for HIV and STI. She currently leads the HIV, STI, TB, and Hepatitis Unit at CAHO. Dr. Monica will present to us the EPI situation, including the global and regional situations, talk, talk with us about nucleates and modes of transmission, um, and other issues around MPOX. Following Dr. Um, Alonso would be Dr. Lionel Gresh, who holds a PhD in human genetics and molecular biology from the Pierre at Marie Curie University Pasteur Institute in Paris. Um, since February of 2017, Dr. Gresh has been working in the laboratory response group of the Infectious Hazard Management 
Kaho Health Emergencies Department focusing on the laboratory sur surveillance and characterizations of characterization of emerging and re-emerging pathogens. Dr. Gresh is a member of Kaho's incident management team for MPOX, and he will speak to us this morning on the laboratory considerations for MPOX. Following Dr. Gresh will be Dr. Omar Suede. He is a medical director specialized in medical doctor specialized in infectious diseases and HIV, trained in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He completed his master's, master and PhD degrees at the University of Barcelona, Spain, served as the chair of the 16th and the 22nd Argentinian Infectious Disease Congresses, served as the former president of the Argentinian Infectious Disease Society and president, presidential committee for the COVID-19 response. Dr. Sved is a member of the governing council of the International Aid Society, and he is currently the Kaho advisor on HIV care and treatment. Dr. Swed will speak to us on the clinical considerations for, of MPOX. Dr. Angel will follow Dr. Swed, and he is a medical doctor with a master's degree in epidemiology and a specialty in hospital preventive medicine. His collaboration with Kaho started in 2009, and his experience includes a response to the influence of COVID-19 and Zika um, outbreaks. He is the advisor, currently as the advisor on clinical management of infectious hazards within the PAHO Health Emergency Units. And Dr. Angel will speak to us about infection prevention and control, including contact tracing. And then to wrap up would be Dr. Margarita Giselli, who obtained her master's degree and doctorate degree in epidemiology from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Giselli started her career in 2014 with the US CDC in the Global Immunization Division and dedicated seven years to support national immunization programs in various countries in the West and Central Africa, including responding to the outbreaks of polio, yellow fever, and Ebola. She is currently the Regional Immunization Public Health Advisor for the Comprehensive Immunization Program of the WHO Regents of America. And Dr. Swade will wrap up today's session and will speak to us on MPOX vaccination. So as you can see, colleagues, um, quite a lineup of experts in the field. And so without further ado, I will hand you over to Dr. Monica Alonso, who will start um, the session with us this morning. Over to you. Thank you very much, Shanti. I will be uh, presenting the first part of uh, the slides and then uh, subsequently um, I will request the other panelists just to um, use the slides that I am presenting and request to, to move the slides as they speak and I will support them with that. So I will be presenting, oops, sorry, on the other date of the MPOX epidemiology and the response. So with regards to the epi situation in the last 12 months, here we can see the number of MPOX cases by the WHO regions. And what we can see is that in the majority of the regions, there is a low level persistence of cases from the 2022 to 2024 outbreak in almost all regions, except uh, in the African region where we see uh, an important surge of cases since July, 2023. So what has happened? What is, what is new? So we all know that we're all hearing and seeing in, in the news and um, the public health emergency declared by WHO in August on the clade 1B MPOX outbreak in the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. So there's a new clade one strain that was first detected in South Kivu. South Kivu is on the east part of DRC. And that uh, new strain or new clade presents a mutation that they will, um, the other experts will uh, speak to, to this a little bit. Um, and this mutation is 
leading us to have sustained human to human transmission. This sustained community spread has been ongoing for several months in absence of a new zoonotic exposure. If we all remember, MPOX um, virus has been with us for many years, constrained to Africa countries, African countries related to zoonosis exposure. So in this new situation, the proposed name is Clade 1B, given the similar human to human transmission as Clade 2B, which emerged in Nigeria in 2017, which is um, the responsible Clade for the 2022 worldwide outbreak. So currently what is happening is that we have a triple MPOX outbreak. We have still in uh, all, most countries of the world, there is a persistent clade 2B outbreak, and that is in light orange, as you can see all um, in, in the Americas, in Europe, and in other regions of the world, that is uh, still the only clade to be present. Then we have in Africa some countries that have exclusively clade 1A, and then we, which is the responsible, is related to the zoonotic transmission. And then we have the countries in Africa, mainly DRC, that have clade 1B outbreak. Of course, we see cases in, uh, we see the mixture of um, clade 1 and clade 2 in Thailand and in Sweden both related to that one imported case in each of the countries. So what are the differences between these clades with regards to the epidemiology? Well, as we mentioned for clade 1A, the origin is the zoonosis. Uh, for clade 1B, it is unknown. And for clade 2B, the origin is also a zoonosis. But there's the difference in, in transmission and uh, is related to also the difference in the most effective groups. So the transmission of 1A is from animal to human and then among humans, but it's mainly not sexual. So the most effective groups are children in rural areas. The infection of for 1A um, has a higher letality, such as around 3.6. So the, the, the transmission and the extension is usually limited to these communities neighboring that animal origin. Now for clade 1B, the transmission has been mostly between humans and mainly through sexual networks. This has been also amplified through social, but think about families, through social networks in areas with less sanitary control. So in general, the most effective groups for clade 1B are also adults related to this type of transmission. And although still being under study, we uh, are seeing or the data that exists until now is that the severity is lower than 1A. Um, and the extension, of course, be because it is um, more easily transmitted between social networks and sexual networks among humans. So that will lead us to more sustained community transmission, similarly to clade 2B, that we saw also that it was between humans mainly through sexual networks, also with a much lower severity and with uh, adults being the most effective groups. So the main characteristics of the confirmed MPOX cases in the last six months, but these, this is based on information of cases outside of the African region, is similar to what we, all, we already knew about MPOX. This has not really changed in which the case, regarding the case profile, well, the majority, 86% um, of cases have reported that they are men who have sex with men. About half are also persons living with HIV. A small percentage, to around 2.5, are health workers. And uh, the majority of the transmission, as we mentioned, is sexual. 
And still, with regards to the severity and the hospitalization, this has also been uh, more or less constant around 10%, and in the Americas, a little bit less of cases have uh, been hospitalized. So here we see the epi curve for confirmed cases in the region of the Americas by epi week. And what we see or what we remember is what, uh, the, you know, the outbreak in 2022 and then the persistent um, throughout, this, meaning that we still have unfinished business. We had the outbreak, but it isn't um, been fully resolved. There are still countries reporting cases. And here we see the number of countries in 2024 are 14 countries that are reporting cases. We think that there may be more cases in other countries and there has been um, possibly uh, less interest or people not going to health services and then those cases do not get reported. But this is what, this is the situation until now and we see here with regards to 2024, we have confirmed 3,223 cases and five deaths. From the Caribbean region, we only have uh, the Dominican Republic that has reported cases in 2024. The rest are from Latin America. And again, the epi characteristics of the cases in our region are very similar to what I presented previously, and also very similar between 2022 and 2023 with regards to what is happening now in 2024, in which the majority of cases are men, the majority of those are MSM, and still there is a strong co-infection with being HIV positive. And again, with regards to hospitalization, as I mentioned, a little bit under 10% of the cases um, have uh, had the need to be hospitalized for different reasons. From now, we will go on to the laboratory considerations. I will invite um, Lionel. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Monica. From next slide, please. Excuse me, Leonet, there, um, let yeah, me see. No problem. Okay, so I'll, I'll just give you a bit of, of, of background about this uh, uh, virus. Um, so this uh, virus is part of a, a family of, uh, the family of uh, Fox uh, viruses, and the name comes from the, the English uh, word uh, Fox, which uh, refers to a postule. Um, it's, th those are uh, viruses that are a, a bit different than, than many of, of those we are, I used to uh, deal with, uh, uh, at least from a virology point of view. Uh, these are uh, relatively large uh, viruses, so they're from 200 to 450 nanometers. That's almost uh, half of a, uh, the size of a bacteria. Uh, they also have a large uh, genome, um, which is uh, uh, double-stranded DNA, so the same uh, genome structure as uh, as we do, uh, and also in in terms of size, quite large uh, for a, a virus. And uh, fox viruses can infect a wide number of of uh, hosts. Next slide. So we have uh, it, it's a quite uh, large uh, family with uh, uh, 24. Uh, yeah, thank you with uh, 24 uh, genera and 83 species. Uh, within this uh, 22 genera, there are four uh, genera that contain viruses that can infect humans. Uh, you have uh, parapox and yetapox viruses that are uh, mostly zoonotic and uh, with uh, limited uh, circulation in humans. Uh, Molluscipox uh, mollus uh, viruses that uh, contain the virus that cause uh, molluscum contagiosum. And uh, the largest uh, family, uh, general uh, genus containing uh, viruses that infect humans is the orthopox uh, virus uh, genus that uh, contains the uh, variola virus that used to cause uh, smallpox. Uh, also the vaccinia virus, which is uh, the uh, smallpox vaccine. Um, also other viruses as acmeta, cowpox, 
and uh, monkeypox, uh, the monkeypox virus that uh, we're uh, dealing uh, with uh, in this presentation. So just to quickly mention that the official name of uh, this, um, uh, as you know, the official name of the disease now is Mpox, and the official uh, name of uh, the virus is Autopox virus monkeypox, although it's referred to uh, generally as a monkeypox uh, virus. There's also an, another virus in this uh, genus you might have heard uh, about recently, the Alaska pox, uh, which is still uh, a bit unclassified, uh, which uh, uh, caused, uh, causes uh, human infections, uh, um, and that has been described as its name indicated in uh, Alaska. So uh, just just um, before I, I move on and, and mention uh, more in more details uh, the properties of uh, the uh, monkeypox virus, uh, I want to clarify that although the name and also the clinical presentation of chick, chicken pox is, is similar to other pox virus, it is not a pox virus and it's called by a completely unrelated uh, virus, uh, the varicella zoster uh, virus, which comes from a, a very uh, different uh, family. Next slide. So as uh, Monica was mentioning, uh, we have several clades or several groups of uh, these viruses and clades is just a, a subgroup uh, within a species here, a monkeypox virus of uh, uh, viruses that share uh, genomic uh, properties so they are close to each other. So before uh, 2022, uh, we had um, two endemic areas for uh, monkeypox viruses that corresponded to two different clades. So there was clade one in Central Africa, uh, and clade two in uh, West Africa. And as was mentioned already in 2022, uh, we had this uh, multi uh, country outbreak that was caused by clade 2B, so a sub clade of clade two. And what we're seeing now is the expansion uh, of a new clade 1B um, um, uh, virus that uh, is a sub clade of clade one, uh, but also, as Monica indicated, circulation of clade 1A. Uh, so this is mainly in DRC and, and neighboring countries. So we're facing, as was mentioned, really the circulation of three uh, different uh, uh, clades of uh, monkeypox virus. Next. And um, no, uh, one before. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, this was uh, already mentioned, we have good evidence that this uh, new clade 1B uh, appeared uh, in the eastern areas of uh, DRC, uh, South Kivu, which is not the um, considered the, an, an endemic area for uh, uh, monkeypox virus. Uh, it has certain uh, genomic signatures on certain types of mutations that indicate that this virus is, is transmitting uh, by a sustain, uh, it's transmitting uh, sustain in a sustainable fashion uh, from humans uh, to humans, uh, and it the evidence points out to a, a, a transmission of um, over uh, 10 months in, in the absence of uh, uh, zoonotic exposure. So which samples do we use for testing, right? The first thing we need to, to be able to do a test for uh, this virus is of course to collect the sample. Uh, the sample, um, there are different types of samples that we can, um, uh, can collect. Um, mainly uh, skin and mucosal lesion. Uh, those are the, uh, our targets because simply that's where the virus is present and, and that also explains uh, the transmission. So these uh, lesions, in, in the skin lesions are full of viral particles and uh, that supports viral transmission. And of course, it also enables uh, the detection of uh, the virus. So in terms of uh, skin lesions, we can use swabs of the lesion of the surface of the lesion or the exudate from these lesions. We can use the roof or the crust from the, from the lesions as well. Ideally, um, one would sample two, at least two different lesions of the same type uh, in a single tube without mix, mixing these different uh, types of uh, samples because they, uh, um, the, the downstream processing in the lab is different. Um, there is also a description of detection of the virus in oropharyngeal swabs. However, uh, the data on the sensitivity of the sample is limited and all other samples are really only collected uh, for uh, research purposes. In terms of the biosafety requirements for the collection, 
Um, I think it's always important to uh, point out that there is a need to conduct a risk assessment depending on the conditions and the situation where the sample uh, will be collected, that this collection is done by uh, trained personnel using uh, all their uh, required uh, uh, PPE, uh, standard precautions, uh, and included, including N95 uh, re respirators uh, if indicated by the uh, risk assessment. And then in the laboratory, uh, we can use uh, what we call now core biosafety measures, uh, and in addition, uh, heightened uh, biosafety measures uh, to limit um, any uh, potential exposure in the laboratory context. Next. I just want to point out that in terms of uh, sample collection, uh, in the, during the 2022-2023 uh, outbreak, there were several injury, uh, injury-related MPOX cases uh, that were due to a needle stick or sharp injury uh, in health uh, care workers. So what we're currently recommending is that the preferred sample is simply a swab of the lesion surface or the ex exudate of the surface. So there is no need to uh, puncture or derive the lesion with a, a, a sharp or, uh, or a needle. Uh, you can just swab the lesion vigorously and this should uh, provide uh, enough uh, material, viral material that can be uh, uh, detected in the downstream uh, laboratory test. And for um, to place the swab, you can, uh, this, this swab after detection can be uh, transported to the lab both dry or in a uh, viral transport medium as uh, we do, for example, for respiratory samples for COVID and other respiratory viruses. Next. Um, very quickly, uh, samples uh, need to be refrigerated uh, after collection and transported uh, to the uh, laboratories uh, promptly, avoiding uh, multiple cycles of uh, freezing and thawing. Um, samples should be shipped uh, always in triple packaging to ensure that uh, no uh, risk is put on people transporting those samples or uh, people are receiving those samples in laboratories. And uh, for international uh, and air transport, uh, these uh, uh, samples are not classified as category B. Next. So in terms of, uh, so now we have a sample in terms of testing uh, what the method we're recommending is uh, the detection of the viral DNA by PCR. Um, as I will mention, uh, sequencing is, is also useful to complement the diagnosis. And there are two strategies that have been used uh, in the Americas for, uh, to implement this uh, uh, detection uh, by PCR. Uh, I'm going to pass on the first algorithm on your uh, left uh, because it's this, this is not uh, very uh, often used, but uh, if we focus on the algorithm on the right, we simply use uh, these uh, samples from uh, the lesions that I was uh, mentioning before to perform a um, uh, PCR that is specific for uh, monkeypox virus. A positive, real, uh, um, a positive result confirms the case, and then this can be followed up with additional uh, PCR testing uh, to uh, detect which clade is causing the infection. Next. So very quickly, just, I just don't want to get too uh, technical, but uh, the idea is once we have the samples, we uh, conduct the extraction of the DNA, and then that DNA is amplified by PCR. Uh, there are several protocols uh, out there, but the one we recommend was a, is a protocol that was designed by uh, the US CDC which is also a PAHO WHO collaborating center for uh, fox viruses. Uh, and they initially um, generated three different assays, one that detects, uh, detects all strains of the virus, so regardless of which clade you are uh, dealing with. And then they had a clade one assay and a clade two assay. Unfortunately, uh, with this new clade uh, 1B, there is no detection with the uh, clade uh, 1 assay, but there are uh, additional protocols that are being developed and validated uh, for the specific detection of this uh, clade 1B. Next. So after uh, we uh, identify a case uh, with a, a, a PCR uh, positive result, uh, then the recommendation is to uh, perform uh, clade-specific uh, PCRs uh, if 
the um, PCR, the clade one PCR is positive, then we're likely uh, dealing with the clade one A uh, virus. Uh, because the clade 1B are not detected by these uh, clade specific PCR. If we are, uh, have a clade 2 uh, positive result, then that could correspond to either clade 2A or clade 2B. And then if uh, both PCRs are clade specific PCRs are negative, then we might suspect the infection by a clade 1B, which would be, then need to be confirmed uh, either with a clade 1B specific PCR or by sequencing. Next. Yeah, so a, a few key messages. Uh, the, the first one that might be the, the most important I haven't mentioned uh, so far is that persons who meet the case definition should be offered testing. Uh, and uh, so these are symptomatic individuals. Uh, there's currently no evidence uh, for uh, testing asymptomatic persons. So the recommended um, diagnostic test, as I was mentioning, is PCR. And this PCR is to be conducted on lesions uh, on lesion swab for exudate, exudate, and this is really the uh, preferred sample because it, it gives the best balance between uh, sensitivity and safety for uh, public health, uh, for uh, health personnel uh, who's uh, collecting uh, this sample. The recommended PCR protocol that uh, we implemented uh, in uh, all countries of the Americas during the 2022-2023 uh, outbreak still detects all uh, viral strains, regardless of the clade. So this capacity that was built together with, with member states uh, in the past two years is still uh, working to detect uh, any uh, monkeypox, uh, mpox case. And this is really the most important because as uh, you will see in the next presentations, there are uh, clinical care considerations, there are uh, ITC considerations uh, that can be implemented right after we have this uh, uh, confirmation, regardless of the clade uh, we're uh, dealing with. And uh, there are uh, new protocols, as I, I was mentioning, that uh, will be able to tell us uh, hopefully soon whether we're dealing with a, a, a clade 1B uh, uh, virus or, or not. Um, that can be done today by uh, using genomic sequencing uh, that, uh, on top of uh, being useful to identify the clade, is also important. Uh, to track mutations that might, might affect the um, sensitivity of the PCR and also to better understand how this virus is spreading and uh, evolving. And uh, finally, I want to mention that the, the uh, technical assistance and key reagents for uh, this uh, recommended PCR essays are available from PAHO and that uh, most of these recommendations uh, uh, can be found on the laboratory guidelines for the detection and diagnosis of uh, monkeypox uh, virus infections that we published at the end of uh, last month. Back to you, Monica. Thank you. Now we will go on to the clinical considerations. So, Omar. I, I cannot hear you, Alan. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much, Anti, Panka, and Monica. Please, the next slide. Uh, so, what we learned in the medical school is that the patient with monkeypox, usually after one or two weeks of the exposure, could have fever, rash. Um, back pain, headaches, this was called prodromal symptoms, and then a simultaneous rash that started as vesicles, then pustules, um, crust, and ulcer, ulcer followed by, by crust that eventually fell off when the, the crust healed. Uh, however, the previous outbreak in 2022, um, there was important difference with the classical M Box, uh, reported from Africa. The patient didn't have prodromal symptoms, the lesions were more genitals, um, and 95% of people were men, in particular men having sex with men or HIV and HIV positive men. So, but there was no big difference between men and women, in, uh, at least, uh, only for, for the higher presence of genital rush among men. Next, please. The, um, so, the, the, the next, please. 
So there are some uh, particular lesions that are uh, important and because produce a, a higher frequency of uh, hospital admission, in particular for pain management. These are the proctitis, the genital and oral use ulcers and tonsillitis. And some of the, this isolation uh, can be associated with the type of sexual activity. So proctitis is more seen in patients that have anal sex, tonsillitis more in people that have oral sex. Next one, please. But, um, but the monkeypox can be fatal. And almost all the fatalities that were reported were among patients with advanced HIV infection. In this area, uh, international area, 382 cases with HIV and less than 350 CD4. We see that almost all the deaths were below 200 CD4, um, but the majority, 27% of the patients with less than 100 CD4 died. Um, during the, the hospital admission. Next one. And the, this report was uh, good describing this new form of monkeypox, this chronic form. Those patients can have monkeypox during two, three, four months until the lesion eventually uh, became necrotic and so infected and patients die of sepsis. Uh, Tecoverimab was, was used in some of those patients, uh, but still the, the prognosis in patients with less than 164 was bad, with more than 50% of the patients using Tecoverimab dying, um, and also reported the emergency of resistance among three of those uh, patients treated in Spain. Next one. Um, but um, we have some uh, description from, from the Caribe. This is two cases from Trinidad and Tobago that make us think that we really need to be, to have a high index of suspicion and we really need to alert the people, in particular MS, uh, having said with men and HIV people that they should ask for, um, or, or to go to the doctor with any minimal lesion that they can have in, in and genitals or even in the skin. Next one. Next. Uh, what is different with this clade 1B? As Monica said, uh, the clade, uh, this virus is more transmissible, so this creates the potential for uh, a higher dissemination. 50% uh, of the cases in Africa are among uh, children or less than 15 years old, so the, the virus is transmissible for person to person, but also through sex. Uh, and the, this strain has a higher mortality than the clade 2B, 1.7%, uh, but fortunately lower than the classical monkeypox in, in, in Africa, that is the mortality is 3 to 10%. Next one. The, um, the recovery map is the is an antiviral that has a efficacy in in vitro and in model animal models. There are other antivirals, cidofovir, brincidofovir, but demonstrated to be more toxic or more uh, have more adverse events. Uh, Tecovirimab is quite well tolerated and has um, a good uh, safety profile. However, there are not information about efficacy and we are still waiting information from the three large uh, randomized studies, STOM, Platinum, Unity, and the recent press release from the PALM 007 shows that it, it, there is no big difference between those that receive the treatment uh, comparing with those that doesn't. Next one. However, uh, the manufacturer has made available some courses of antiviral tecovirimab to the WHO and PAHO will be distributing some tecovirimab uh, at the country request, in particular at those countries that has a higher local epidemiology uh, or, uh, and to be used with, with severe patients. And this tecovirimab should be used only uh, under the MEURI protocol and tomorrow the PAHO will be opening a, a platform uh, to start recording those uh, patients that require the COVID. Next one. So in summary, uh, in still now, even this declared one V appear in, in DRC in Latin America, the most of the cases continue to be uh, to be and continue being in among men, uh, usually men having sex with men and um, um, people with HIV. 
the burden of disease severity mortality is much higher in people with HIV, in particular with less than 100 CD4. And for this reason, any patient with a symptom suggestive of monkeypox and pox should be offered an HIV test and linked to prevention or treatment. There is not a proven treatment, uh, but we can have access to this antiviral through uh, the MEURI framework. And those health authorities that are interested in implementing this MEURI protocol should contact the local PAHO office. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar. Um, okay, well, now we have uh, Dr. Angel Rodriguez. Okay. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, colleagues in the Caribbean. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I'm going to talk about IPC measures and recommendation. Next, please. So the first slide here is to reiterate that the recommendations uh, posted and publicated by WHO in 2022 are still valid. Okay, the guideline is available there, and I'm going to cover the following aspects that are um, in the left of the screen. Next, please. Okay, so as we learn about the disease, the virus, and also the clinical presentation, it's important to start, and basically this is for suspected cases coming to healthcare facilities with the screening, trials, isolation, and clinical assessment. Okay, this is basic, uh, is based on clinical guidelines, yes, but also there is available some screen algorithms that are available in the guideline for these purposes that you can use but basically you need to be aware about the rash, fever, and lymphadenopathy, and always using PPE uh, for the trials as a distance of one meter, okay? And I'm going to talk about the PPE later on on this. Uh, the isolation of the patients that are suspected are important, first after the screening, and if very, uh, there's rooms available, if not, there's no single rooms available, you need to look for a single space well ventilated, and uh, guarantee that more than one meter between patients. Ventilation always put the patient with a mask and in the facilities in the trials, you need to start with uh, mask available, uh, chirical mask, but also uh, alcohol-based uh, health for clean. The next, please. And, and this is related from basically the, mild, the management of male, mild mpox, okay? With Omar previously described about the case uh, and the severity in this case, but this is specifically for mild patients, okay? So right now, just to inform you that WHO is currently updating the guidelines for the management in, in, in home base uh, for patients that is not published yet, but here we are presenting some uh, recommendations to manage these these uh, patients. Okay, of course they need to be isolated at home when they suspected, and then take the samples as you know described uh, properly. Okay, and this isolated at home when it's confirmed it to be like the onset of symptoms was onto the cross of the of the system uh, uh, cross of the lesions. Okay. And the lesions need to be, basically, these need to be in a isolated room. Only one person of family need to manage the, the patient. And if possible, all the mpox, mild uh, case need to uh, be managed. All the things related to their care, you know, single use of, uh, of dish, etc. And also the management of the linen that need to be never shaken. Roll and, and wash it with a wash, a soap, uh, water, uh, uh, more than 66 centimeters, and if not with chlorine, with chlorine as well, but never checking it to be wrong. As well, okay, this is for un uncomplicated uh, patients, and they need to be treated with these uh, infection prevention and control measures. Okay, um, they need to be restricted. Yeah, thank you. The next one is more for a suspected confirmation and the disease. Uh, this measure for IPC is based on the transmission of the virus. Okay, so we learned in the previous slides about the male the transmission. The transmission of this now and the, this virus is still contact, direct contact, physical contact, but also sexual contact, and in some cases with droplets. So that's why we need to standard all in all cases standard precautions for loss, contact, and droplet precautions. Okay. In addition, if the 
patient is confirmed or suspected with varicella zoster, uh, respiratory precaution, airborne precaution need to be implemented. Okay. When a patient is confirmed with MPOX, contact a droplet precaution still is recommended. And also, again, the use of respirator when it's varicella zoster virus. Uh, confirm or suspect. There is really very limited evidence about the transmission of uh, the disease, the virus through res respiratory airborne mode. Okay, there are one or two studies that are uh, um, put some evidence, not the best evidence here, but that's why we are reiterating the use only with this varicella zoster virus precaution, but also when the uh, aerosol generated particles are performed. We need to uh, put the patient in. Uh, and the clinicians airborne precautions okay um, the areas need to be really of course uh, very well defined and also put in the in the in the room of the patient all these measures that are put it and clean it uh, with water so very frequently the most important thing is the contact okay limited the contact with the patient and then uh, cleaning the surfaces that the patient is contact on or over okay all the linens, hospital gowns, towels, etc., need to be uh, handled and collected carefully according to the local um, uh, regulations, okay, and also the body fluids and solid waste need to be managed as infectious disease according to local regulations, okay. Uh, in the best situation at the hospital, uh, have space, need to be in a single room, but if not, uh, a very well ventilated room, but a specifically designated a bathroom and uh, shower for the patient and share with other. Okay, and then also in the case of deceased patients, uh, the handling of, of these remains need to be performed with contact droplet and respiratory uh, airborne precaution as well. Okay, uh, all the patient uh, healthcare workers and contacts need to be really. Uh, have a line list, okay, of people in contact with the, the patients, uh, and then do a, a self-assessment uh, and follow up with this, okay? Any sus next, please. Any suspect case that fulfill the, the, the case definition, okay, probably need to be uh, have a sample and monitoring. And this is really the summary of the PPE that is recommended, and you can see in the screen is basically gone. The respirator is N95 recommended. Or equivalent and for eye protection, you can do the goggles or a face mask and also the, the gloves that are here. And then it's uh, very important to train the healthcare workers in the uh, step to put on, but also to remove the PPE as is indicated in, in the screen. Also, with starting to perform hand hygiene, then put gown on, the mask, uh, uh, respiratory correct, and then the goggles or face mask, and finally with the with the um, gloves on, okay? And then the procedure to remove is, is, is to the right as well. Remember to train these frequently healthcare workers, but also follow up the, the program for IPC in your healthcare facilities as well. Okay, if the patient that is mild, that is not management at the hospital base, uh, uh, you need to be sure that can be managed at home. If not, you need to manage in the hospital base. Next, please. Uh, this is the resources available, including a guideline from PAHO that is from uh, closed settings like uh, prisons and other custodial facilities that are published there uh, in addition to the WHO guideline. Okay. The next topic is about contact tracing. Okay, that is following, we're following this uh, with my management. This recommendation for contact tracing is uh, are there, also available there for 2022. There is no change about the contact tracing guidance. As you know, the objectives of the contact tracing is the next one. Thank you. Uh, and we, and we, I think you as an EPI person are barely aware of this because of COVID and other unpopular situation as well. But basically it's identify contacts early or from people who are suspected to interrupt transmission. Okay. The notification of contacts need to be to the local uh, EPI um, investigators or the public health uh, responders, okay? And then with that, have this identification and monitor the contacts for symptoms until 21 days. You know, the incubation period for disease is six to 13 days. Uh, and, the remain, the, uh, and then, but you can follow 
on the uh, on the 21 days. Okay, next please. This is the definition of a contact, and, and it's really related with the transmission of the disease. That is, anyone exposed to an infected person during this period mentioned with a direct physical contact. Okay, face to face, skin to skin, or mucosal. Okay, or contact with contaminated virus, clothing, bedding, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or also uh, management during cleaning procedures in the hospital. Uh, and, and, and also the uh, aspects for uh, airborne generating particles as well. Okay. Uh, the other is the problem cocktail with face to face respiratory special. That this is basically the pa family uh, that is in uh, management the patient. Okay. Or exposure to lesion materials, no scrubs, scrubs. Yeah, and as mentioned before, because work workers exposed without uh, appropriate PPE. Uh, with the patient, okay? And then this is the, the next one is the process about this contact tracing. It's basically uh, the contact identification, identification, monitoring, and management. I'm going to focus only on the monitoring. The monitoring until 21 days based on the case definition and specifically with symptoms like headache, fever, and rash. Okay, it can be like passive, uh, conducted by the contact, active, monitoring that uh, a public health specialist calling the patient or, or 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 direct or dependent resources can be direct and going to to, to the home. Okay, it's very important like uh, that there is no symptoms uh, of this contact. The contact do not need to be isolated. Okay, it's basically the monitoring. I need the symptoms start. Uh, uh, a new contact tracing for that person need to be established if it's confirmed. Etc. Of course, we need to take sample and then test it for that. Okay, there is next, please. There are several, um, this is just a summary of the process, several tools to conduct contact tracing and support and facilitate that with the identification of the, of the case first and the patient, the contacts, the line list. Okay, uh, of course, this is based on the definition of the contact, follow up and information period. Etc., etc., and then monitoring and, and reporting. Okay, and then the treatment as well. Important is this confirmed. Uh, there is several options like GoData, etc. Tomorrow, uh, WHO is hosting a GoData uh, experience actually for two countries in America's management and box. If you want to assist, just please contact me. I can provide you with the link uh, and follow this chain of transmission. Next, please. And this is, I think, finally is about travel related, very important for, from for the Caribbean, okay? And, and this is related with public, managed by public health authorities and IHR, and the transportation, of course. And just to highlight two things, you know, the long distance travels uh, near a confirmed case should be notified. In airplanes, usually it's two lines uh, in front and, and uh, in the back, two lines to, uh, for the patient. Okay, and, and this can be applied here because you don't know if it's by herpes, by cell soster also involved. Okay, and then need to be followed the notifications from the cruises, etc. And again, no quarantine is required if the asymptomatic contact is, is recorded, but monitoring, yes, uh, and follow up as well. Okay, I think this is the last one for this. And there are the resources available, uh, include some all doing contact tracing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Angel. Um, and now we will go to our last panelist on MPOX vaccines. Margarita. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to uh, present the latest recommendations from the WHO on MPOX vaccination. These were published on the 23rd of August, so just a month ago, and represent the latest recommendations uh, on, this, on this product. So first of all, just to be aware, uh, the currently available, available smallpox and mpox vaccines are based on live vaccinia virus or orthopox virus. And there are three generations of vaccines. The first generation is the one that was developed for the smallpox eradication program in the 50s uh, into the 70s. This is not something that WHO currently recommends for use. Rather, the focus is now on second and third generation vaccines. So in the next slides, you will hear me talk about the ACAM 2000, which is the second generation 
generation vaccine, which uses the same vaccinia virus vaccine strains as the first generation, but are produced uh, in tissue culture cells so to attenuate some of the uh, adverse events following vaccination. And then the third generation vaccines, which is the MVABN from Bavaria Nordic and LC16M8, which is a vaccine produced in Japan, uh, which further enhance the safety. So ACAM2000, uh, MVABN and LC16M8 are the three that we're going to be discussing today and the ones mentioned in this document from WHO. Next slide, please. So let's start with ACAM2000, which is a second generation vaccine. I won't read ed everything on this slide. I'll just underscore a few key points. So ACAM2000 is a vaccine approved by the US uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, for immunization against both smallpox and MPOX. It is administered in a single dose through the scarification uh, method of using a bifurcated needle. Uh, but this vaccine does have some safety concerns, especially with regards to myopericarditis, which you remember is an enlargement of the heart muscle, uh, where in the uh, persons who have received this vaccine, so there is a higher than expected incidence in myopericarditis compared to the general population. In terms of efficacy, we see that uh, zero conversion varies between 76% and 97%, so it seems to be an efficacy vaccine, a vaccine that does produce an antibody response. But this vaccine has not been studied in pregnant women and it is not recommended for use in immunocompromised persons. Next slide. So the next two vaccines are the third generation vaccines. MVABN is the vaccine that uh, was available in the Americas in 2022 and 2023. This is a vaccine that is administered in two doses subcutaneously, uh, and the two doses are administered four weeks apart. Uh, it can also be administered intradermally in a fractionated dose, meaning that only a fifth of the full dose is given. And this is a strategy that is used in situations where there is limited availability of vaccine doses. So there are studies ongoing to determine the safety and efficacy of giving a fractionated dose. But so far, the available studies seem to uh, report a, a positive effect and safety profile. With regards to safety, the uh, safety profile is much better compared to the ACAM 2000. Uh, very few serious adverse events, actually none of them were reported in 22 studies that have been reviewed, and there have been only a very few cases of myocarditis among the hundreds of thousands of persons who have received this vaccine. In terms of efficacy, how well this vaccine works, works there has been systematic reviews. Uh, the uh, efficacy profile is quite good for vaccines that were administered before exposure to the MPOX vaccine. The post-exposure vaccine effectiveness uh, estimate does not seem to be as good, only 20%. However, we must consider that only seven studies were included in this analysis with different periods considered between exposure and vaccination. We know that with post-exposure vaccination, it works best if the vaccine is administered quickly after exposure within the first four days. So this study, this analysis took into consideration different periods. So that's why we're presenting both pre-exposure and post-exposure vaccine efficacy uh, studies here. And then finally, in terms of contraindication, again, there are very limited data on the effect of, of the efficacy of this vaccine and safety profile among pregnant persons, and limited evidence suggests that this vaccine may be safe in persons with well-controlled HIV infection. And next slide. So this is the LC16M8. This is a third generation vaccine that it currently is available only in Japan. This vaccine also is administered in a single dose through the scarification method. It has a very good safety profile based on the information available. And in terms of, back of zero conversion, uh, it ranges between 60% and 100% uh, 30 days after uh, vaccination. Again, we have no data available on the safety profile for this vaccine among pregnant person, and it is at this point not recommended for persons who are immunocompromised. Next slide. Now, 
for all three vaccines, there are some common characteristics. First of all, uh, some elements have not been studied in the uh, data that we have just shown you. First of all, co-administration, the administration of any of these three vaccines against MPOX with any other vaccine. So unlike with, for example, the COVID vaccines, which can be co-administrated with the influenza vaccine, there are no data on the safety profile of administering one MPOX vaccine with any other vaccine. Interchangeability, we, uh, there are also no data available on whether you can administer one dose of one type of MPOX vaccine followed by a dose of another MPOX vaccines. And also there are no data available on the cost effectiveness of MPOX vaccination, even though uh, many studies for almost all vaccines show that there is some cost effectiveness compared to not uh, using any kind of vaccination. In terms of modeling that has been done for MPOX outbreaks in the United States, it found that the initial decline in cases that was seen in 2022 and continuing in 2023 was likely caused by behavioral changes, but of course vaccination averted more cases overall and uh, expedited the resolution of the outbreak, meaning that the outbreak was able to be uh, minimized more quickly because vaccines were available. Next slide. Now, here we come into the recommendations again from this document from August 2023. So the information I presented up until now was the updated information, and now we present the recommendations. So exactly as in 2022 and 2023, in 2024, mass vaccination, again, MPOX, is not required nor recommended, which means that the WHO is not recommending a mass vaccination in the general population against MPOX in any country in the world. However, since we are in a situation of outbreaks since 2022, vaccination is recommended for persons at high risk of exposure to MPOX. And this includes four, uh, cat four groups. First of all, we have persons who live in geographically defined areas where there is a risk of community, where there is community transmission uh, for MPOX. This is a situation that we see more in countries of Africa that are currently affected by the clade 1A and 1B, where zoonotic transmission is present. So this is not a profile that we would currently, uh, as of today, associate with the Americas. Uh, the next group is composed by sex workers gay, bisexual, or other men who have sex with men with multiple sexual partners, or other persons with multiple casual sexual partners. Another category is health workers at risk of repeated exposures. So this is an important uh, point to make. Healthcare workers who work with uh, persons at high risk of MPOX uh, infection, but who follow, implement all the IPC recommendations that our colleague Angel has just presented here are not considered to be at high risk of exposure to MPOX. We're talking here specifically of health workers who, for whatever reason, do not have access to uh, proper personal protective equipment or don't have the opportunity to follow the IPC measure, the infection prevention and control measures. These are the persons for whom MPOX vaccination is recommended. But a healthcare worker in a clinic who has access to the proper PPE and implements the proper IPC measures is not considered a person at high risk, again, at this moment. And then finally, we have the contacts of persons, uh, persons who are infected with MPOX. So if you remember Dr. Angel's slide about who is a contact, of a persons with MPOX. Here we are talking about the persons who meet this definition of a contact, and ideally these persons should be uh, vaccinated within the first four days of exposure to minimize the risk of developing symptoms and, and possibly stemming the uh, interrupting the chain of transmission. Next slide. So uh, in the last few slides, I want to talk about a few very practical consideration. And the first and foremost is MPOX vaccine availability, not only for countries in the Americas, but really at the global level. So following the fake declaration, the Public Health Emer uh, Emergency of International Concern declaration, which the WHO put out on the 14th of August, 2024, so six weeks ago, uh, since then, PAHO has actively been actively involved in global conversations with the vaccines manufacturers to determine uh, the availability of the MPOX vaccines uh, for the Americas. 
Of course, because this is a public health emergency of international concern, uh, we are working at the global level, as we said, and vaccine supply is quite limited at this time. So countries are looking to accessing vaccine within, six, within the next six to nine months. So for the Americas, in most countries, the first doses of Mpox vaccines are scheduled to arrive in January 2025. And this is a very important point, and I will develop it in my next slide, please which is also my last. So considering that, um, as we've seen before, for the 2022 and 20, 2023 outbreaks and waves, we saw that uh, cases started to uh, reduce, to decline, uh, once behavior changes were implemented. And also considering the limited supply of vaccines that I've just been uh, describing, uh, I want to underscore a point that WHO has made multiple times since 2022, which is vaccination should be considered an additional measure to complement primary public uh, health interventions, meaning that countries should not wait for the uh, to receive a vaccines before they start impl uh, implementing any kind of public health interventions to minimize the transmission of this virus. Vaccination, and even when vaccines are available, vaccination should not replace other protective measures. So again, to emphasize this, uh, even when vac vaccines will not be available in our region for some months, and even when they are available, they are one of the many measures that countries can implement to minimize and hopefully interrupt quickly this outbreak. So I will end here. This was my last slide. And of course, along with my colleagues, we are more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. I'm not sure how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Okay, Monica, I took the screen from you. You're not sharing your screen anymore. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so colleagues, thank you very much. Um, thanks to all of our presenters, Dr. Monica Alonso, um, Dr. Omar Sue, Dr. Margarita Giselli, Dr. Angel Rodriguez and Dr. Lionel Gresh. Thank you. It was very, very comprehensive. I think we've covered so many grounds um, from the epidemiology all the way down to vaccination. Um, colleagues, I want to remind you that you could type your question in using the chat feature on your webinar panel. So go ahead and submit any questions that you have. Um, we have time, our panelists would be able to take um, your questions and provide responses to them. So please do go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so at this point, we don't have any questions, Monica. I, I, um, I'm assuming that um, our colleagues are submitting them. Um, I'm beginning to see the question marks, but um, just I want to thank you all for providing um, so much information in this one hour and, and we will take the questions, but starting from the epidemiology, Monica, um, being able to talk us through that um, in terms of the, um, the different clits and the laboratory diagnosis, looking at the algorithm. So thank you, um, Dr. Gresh. Um, a really very practical algorithm, I think. Um, Omar, thanks for, for walking us through um, the clinical considerations and being able to share with us some of the studies that, that have taken place and some of the ongoing studies. Um, touching on treatment, I think that was really very important as well. Um, and to um, fair presenter Dr. Angel on the infection control, really very practical um, messages from WHO in terms of who is a case, who is a suspected case, how do we define a contact, um, and the steps to contact tracing, and not just the steps, but a timeline in which we should really take um, these steps into consideration. And thank you, Dr. Giselli, for all of the information on vaccines, walking us through the different generations of vaccine, but really being able to um, go deeper into the characterization of the second and the third generation 
vaccines and really looking at the safety, efficacy, and all of the contraindication for the different for the different vaccines. So again, pretty comprehensive, um, and I do appreciate um, all of the information that has been shared. We have some questions that have come in. Um, one of the questions is if you have chicken pox, can you can you still take if you've had chicken pox, can you still take the monkey pox, the M pox vaccine? Um, I don't know. I'll take that question. Thank you very much. There are no contraindications, again, at this time, based on the available evidence that a person who has had uh, chickenpox uh, cannot take the vaccine against mpox. So this is not a, a limitation. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? No. Any, any? <clears throat> I would say that this, uh, the confirmation of chickenpox is not an Mpox because in some um, series up to 10% of the children in Africa could have a co-infection and it's probably because um, the chickenpox infection increases susceptibility and also increase the contact of the of, um, of I mean because the the, the 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 risk of the, the monkey pox to penetrate the, the mm -hmm. at, at somebody to, yeah even build on your point um dr Mar, um a question has come in um on whether um persons with suspected chicken pox should be tested for m pox for a sort of Absolutely. differential diagnosis I, I think Lionel is the expert in the laboratory but clinically i would say absolutely yes yeah okay perfect um dr Gresh, there is a question that i think that relates to you whether there are sequencing protocols that are currently available for mpox that's a a very very good question so there is an effort um conducted by who on trying to compile the available protocols and to share with countries so uh please um stay tuned for that uh, happy to uh share my my email uh and uh just mention there are a couple of countries that have in the region that are, have implemented that um currently we have um risk sequences from brazil um ecuador uh, the united states and and canada but uh certainly something we're looking in, into and uh, we should be able to share protocols they're being adjusted to be sure that they cover this new uh, clade 1b but we should be able to share a uh, protocol for uh, whole genome sequencing uh, very soon over okay thank you dr Grish. um so there's some other questions but but omar i wanted to ask you in terms of the access to the treatment i know you said there would be a platform that will be open tomorrow could you tell us a little bit more about about that? Yeah, we, we say access to the antiviral because we cannot say it's a treatment yet because we don't have okay. uh, information about the efficacy of proven uh, documentation about the activity of and and, and actually the, the last trial that the Palm 007 show uh, presented a press release that they couldn't see efficacy. It was very bad news for us because everybody was just thinking that it's an antiviral as an activity in animal model, and we were all waiting for this information. So we need to continue using those uh, measures in a clinical trial. There are open clinical trials in US, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, and Argentina, but in places where it's no clinical trial, the, the patient should be using this, only severe, severe patients should be receiving this drug uh, under the protocol. This means that the country need to request the protocol to PAHO, uh, up, make the protocol be approved in the ethical committee, in the local ethical committee, go to the request, need to contact the, the PAHO office um, and confirming they have the, the interest on receiving some doses of tecovirimab. And, and the final word 
will be given by WHO based in the high risk of uh, having severe patient. This means if there are recent cases in the country or in the neighbor countries, and uh, so the, 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 this is a mechanism. They, they should contact the national authorities. Should contact the PAHO office. Um, and today, the, all the national authorities participating in the emergency committee of PAHO are receiving this information uh, by, by through the emergency center. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Omar. I think that that's um, that's clear. Um, nonetheless, there's a follow-up question that's um, from one of our participants is that consider the evidence that we have at this time, what would be the most, the best time to initiate the use of, of antiviral tecovirumab? We really don't know. We really don't no. know because we thought that was, it will be working better early. Uh, and this is the, the result of the PAM 007 that showed that no different when it started early in those patients. So maybe we need to reserve for very sick patients and potentially in combination with others you know, to avoid the emergency of resistance. But we yeah. don't know. Thank you, Dr. Mar. Um, Dr. Ciselli, um, I think we have two questions here on vaccine. <laughs> so the first question, if is that since there has been no study that the vaccine could be given with other vaccines, I'm not sure. Um, what would be your advice on that? Um, Co-administration, I think, with other vaccines. And then the second question is, um, for the vaccine development, um, is consideration given to the vaccine strain um, as vaccine development is happening? So two questions on vaccines. Sure. So for the first one with regard to co-administration, the reason why two vaccines are not recommended to be co-administered unless the co-administration have been thoroughly studied is that if there are any adverse events following vaccination, it's very difficult to say they're due to which vaccine, especially if one uh, has limited studies as the one in MPOX, we're still gathering information. So the general recommendation here is to uh, when there are no information on co-administration is to have a vaccine doses administered at least two weeks apart. So again, it's very clear uh, any if any adverse events do occur, uh, if they are uh, associated with one vaccine versus another. So so that would be the, the recommendation. With regard to the second question, could you repeat it, please? Whether um, in the vaccine development process, whether consideration is given to the vaccine strain, whether it's clear, clear one, clear two, Yes. So, so far, there uh, are no vaccines that have been designed specifically for one clade versus another. So, if, for example, tomorrow, a case of the clade 1B should, uh, were to be identified in the Americas, um, and if this person is eligible for vaccination, this person would receive the same vaccines that is available for, for any other, for, for the clade 2B, which are all the cases that have been identified in the Americas so far. So again, there's no differentiation uh, between clades with regards to vaccine products, again, at this time. All right, thank you. I think um, the next question is to Dr. Angel. Um, would you recommend social distancing for an outbreak if it's at the community level? Let me unmute myself. No, the, we don't recommend that. Okay, as, as indicated in the IPC measure, is basically for management at home and also healthcare facilities, and then they have a secure distance of at least one meter using the appropriate PPE. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other question at this time. Um, so I think we can we can wrap up now. Um, I'm not seeing any other question. No one is typing either. Um, so colleagues, thank you all very much. Um, Dr. Monica, Dr. Lionel Gresh, Dr. Margarita Giselli, Dr. Omar Sweat, Dr. Dr. Angel Rodriguez. Thank you all very much for taking us through um, the update on MPOX. I think it has been a really excellent session, a lot of knowledge that has been shared, um, and I like that we were able to um, cover from the epidemiology to all the different aspects and then um, even talk um, quite a bit about vaccines. 
I will share the presentations with um, all of the participants. And, and in fact, I'll share the presentation with everyone who registered for, for the webinar. Maybe they were not able to um, not able to attend, but they will get the, the presentation. Someone says that they don't have a question. It was very informative session, very clear and to the point. Um, and so we understand why. Um, so again, thank you participants for joining us. Thank you colleagues from PAHO for, as usual, supporting PANCAP and being able to share knowledge in the region. Um, and this brings us to the end. Please respond to our survey. You will receive a survey in the next minute once we close the webinar. Please report, please um, give us your feedback and we look forward to welcoming you to our next uh, webinar, which will be um, on Wednesday, I think, on HIV and aging and non-communicable diseases. Do take care, everybody, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.